Hi, everyone. Uh, it, it's been a while, so you are listening to Certified Forgotten. Just in case you had forgotten, see, we put it in the name. It's, it's, a, it's a whole thing. Uh, I am one half of your Matt hosts, Matthew Monagle. I am joined, as always, by the, the, the Matt to my Matt, or the Matt to my Matt, Matt Tonato. How you doing, buddy? I'm confused now, but I think we'll get over it. No, it's it's good. It's good. See, there's going to be people that haven't listened to any of our past episodes, and this is what they jump in on. Um, and I want them to, I don't even want to make it to like the 15 second mark. I don't even want it to count as a listen in Google Analytics. They're just like off and done. Two mats are never enough. Let's just, let's say that. That is, uh, eh, I, I know other mats. Two mats is fine. Uh, so if you haven't listened to the show before, as a reminder, uh, this is Certified Forgotten. It's a show that looks back at some of the forgotten movies. Our criteria is anything that has five or fewer reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's sort of our way of, you know, there are hundreds of horror films that are released every single year. We're trying to dig through um, the bargain bin a bit, find good movies that people didn't latch on to or not so good movies that people wisely forgotten. We're in the, the process of discovery here, rediscovery. And today's film is Patchwork. We're gonna talk all about that in a second and why I'm so mad that my friends picked it. But before we get to there, uh, Matt, can you introduce this week's guest, please? Yeah, I'm going to let the guest introduce herself because I'm not sure how she would like me to introduce her. So I would like to introduce my friend, my <laughs> enemy, and you, you, you can go. How, how do you want to go on this podcast? Um, well, you know, it started with enemy, so let's just stick with that. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Amelia. Um, you can find me all over the internet. I am a film critic, a television critic. I like horror a lot. And that's why I'm here. That's it. Amelia, how are you doing after the, um, I, I, I don't watch it, but I know that the big crossover uh, CW superhero event thing, I know you were covering that and writing a lot about that for a couple of different sites. Are you fully recovered after that exhaustive couple of week process? It was exhaustive. That is the correct word to say. Um, it was it was very good. And I'm feeling rejuvenated now. I've slept a little bit. And then we went right into the Arrow finale. So there's a lot there, but we're done now. Good news is this will be a bit of a palate cleanser for you, this particular conversation. Totally. So we, when we uh, when we invite somebody on, um, you, you've listened to other episodes, I'm sure you kind of get a feel for it. One of the things that Matt and I are, are curious about is where everybody gets their start with the horror genre, because it's a, it's a personal thing. It's something that gets people excited. Film critics like to talk about their first horror movie. So... Where did where did this start for you? You know, you you, you write about horror films. Um, you t- obviously you talk to us about horror films a lot. Do you, what were the first couple that you remember seeing, and what do you remember feeling when you watched them? So I feel like my start in horror is kind of boring. Like nothing really sparked it necessarily. I grew up in like a really small town where like we didn't have access to a lot of horror, like especially new horror, because we had one screen in our town. Um, but. Uh, started with things like Goosebumps and like Scooby-Doo. And I don't really remember what like my first big horror movie was. Um, But I remember when uh, I was like 13, we were watching the Texas Chainsaw remake. Um, So probably that would be real early for me, like so far as films go. So my question then to that Mm. is, when you said your start is boring, I kind of understand that. My start as well, I didn't have anyone to like kind of guide me and show me and stuff like that. I just had to find it all myself. So was there anyone who was like an influence on your hard journey or was this self-reflective? It was pretty self-reflective. I didn't talk to a whole lot of people when I was little. <laughs> uh, I was, I, I kept to myself a lot growing up. Um, but like, I would say... A librarian, probably, whose name I've long since forgotten, um, just for like pointing me in the direction of like R.L. Stein and stuff like that. And then like just outside of Goosebumps, like his cheerleader saga and stuff like that. And then eventually that pushed into Stephen King and then Anne Rice and then eventually film. So you were you were shaped by a librarian that was trying to scare the hell out of kids and instead instilled a love of horror in you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's go yeah. That. No, that, that works. <laughs> No, I, I really relate to that, though, because it was kind of the same for me. Like, I read Goosebumps, and I was a coward about them. 
Um, but then I got to a point where I'm like, I'm, I'm old now. I can't read Goosebumps. Goosebumps are for kids. I'm going to read like, you know, uh, Stephen King books. I'm going to read that. And then th- that was just like way too much. And I had no idea why I'd made that leap. But then, you know, that stuff scares you so bad that you start getting into it and you start at some point you've turned a corner. And I re- don't remember when I went from reading, I don't even remember what my first Stephen King book was, but from like kind of reading one of them a couple pages at a time and being afraid and then like devouring all of his new stuff. But I, I can very, in hindsight, I can very kind of cleanly track you know, going from that early goosebumps that I was reading and being really scared by it. And then suddenly I'm in the horror aisle at the library, just like grabbing anything with a good cover. Absolutely. That, uh, the slappy cover for me kept me, kept me away from goosebumps for a little bit as a child, because fuck that. Yeah. He's a nightmare. Don't you, aren't you, isn't like demon dolls, one of your things though now, wouldn't you describe that as? Yeah, no, no, no. Child, child's play was forever. My, uh, aversion to the horror aisle and blockbuster. A slappy was my aversion to the horror child section <laughs> in any li- library or bookstore. So for some reason, Demon Dolls, the the idea of something innocent and making it so fucking demonic and evil did not play with Little Donato or High School Donato. <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, Matt. Uh, but now I know that I can put dolls outside of rooms I don't want you to go into and you won't cross the threshold. That's pretty. Oh, dude, no. Chuck- Chucky's my favorite slasher now. Per- that, that's pretty all powerful. Like it's. It's come full circle in the sense that, like, even my mom is like, I can't even torture you anymore. Like, you like Child's Play now. If I ever did anything, you'd be like, this is awesome. And I'm like, yeah, fuck you. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Amelia, I, w- I want to ask, too, because this I don't actually know. Um, talking about your early experiences with horror, when did you start to get into film criticism? When did you start writing about, you know, all, all the different types of film and television that you write about? When did you make that leap? And, and was there a period where it was just a hobby beforehand? And then you kind of, quote unquote, went pro with it? Um, what was that like? Yeah, so um, it started with like comic book shows, obviously. Um, I would I would live tweet about them. And like this was back when I had like 400 followers on Twitter and somebody from some random website whose name I don't even remember anymore was like, what if you came and wrote for us? And this was still what I was writing for free. Um, And so I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. I like talking about these things. I talk about them on Twitter anyways. So it started there. And then um, Rachel Romero from Amy Poehler's Smart Girls, or at least she was at the time. Now she's with Critical Role, uh, saw some of my work. and was like, I want you to come talk about this stuff over on Smart Girls, which is a part of the Nerdist umbrella. And so that that was my first paying gig. And then... As things progressed, I shifted from talking exclusively about shows to also talking about film. And that was three years ago. Yeah, three years ago um, with Birth Movies Death is when I officially like started integrating film into that conversation as well. So you you get get paid for your work? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's how this works. Yeah, I, I made it a rule. Work until, you know free until it's not free anymore and then it's not free ever again morals yeah yeah no i i respect that i mean you're part of you're part of the matt and matt day job crew anyway so how you choose to spend that time and it's extremely important you know you i feel like that's one of the things that, that matt and i talk a lot about is the way that we choose to spend our time um for donato's case it's devouring every horror film of any budget that ever existed I'd like to think I'm a little bit more critical than that, but you know, when it's the, when you, it isn't something that you need to do to support yourself, it really allows you to be you know, passionate about the types of things that you're writing about. Absolutely. And like, there are so many, like we go to these festivals and like, there are so many people who are kind of like jaded about the industry, which makes sense. Our industry is tumultuous right now, but like, they're so mm-hmm. tired and kind of don't want to be there. And I'm just like, I'm so excited to be here. Like I waited all year for this. This is super important to me. So. Well, and that's, you know, talking about the day job thing really quickly. Oftentimes I talk to people who have staff jobs and websites and magazines, stuff like that, who have what I consider to be my dream job. Mm -hmm. But then they come to me and they're like, you have it figured out. You have a job outside the industry and then you get to write on your free time. Like that's the way to do it nowadays. And I have so many mixed emotions about that where, I mean, openly and honest, I do think I have it figured out in a certain way because I have safety. I write on the side. If I ever stopped writing and that went away, my life would not change that much except I would stop writing and going to festivals and, you know, making friends in that industry. 
But the large part of my life, the day job aspect and my safety and salary and stuff like that benefits, it, it wouldn't change. So like there is something positive to saying that. But at the same time, I am so goddamn tired. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I think the thing that they don't understand <laughs> is we work full day jobs where, I mean, I'm putting 110% into my day job. It's not like I'm slacking off. Like, I am good at what I do during isn't the day. Isn't it though? Is, is it though? <laughs> well, Mr. Isn't Monagle, it? Mr. Monagle, then easy. Just because I'm good at managing and delegating and I can do other <laughs> things as I'm working does not mean I'm not doing my job. Well, that's fair. Okay, that's fair. And you and I have talked about that a little bit where like, because you and I work basically the same job at our day job and then we come home and we write and, you know, I get the same conversation of like, you've sorted it out, you're doing this and you're doing this. I'm like, okay. Yes, you're correct. And all of the things that you said, like I do have these benefits and that's nice. Um, but also I am some weeks working 90 hours at my day job and then coming home and working an ungodly amount of hours consuming media, writing about media. So I'm just like, like the weeks get insane. So kind of figured it out, but also I kind of want to nap. Yeah, no, it, and it, this is nothing to say against mm. people who do have the day jobs and, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, they work just as hard. This, this isn't pitting one against the other. It's no. just highlighting the different ways in our industry, our quote unquote industry at this point, everything is evolving. Everything is changing and no one knows what kind of the next front of what our industry will look like. And I don't know if it doesn't look like something where critics and writers don't have a side job or they do have a side job and what we do is supported by a job that we don't particularly love or enjoy that much, but we do it anyway because it gives us the the reason to live in LA and it gives us the ability to, you know, I'm looking around my apartment and like do what I do, but also have a side career, quote unquote, that still like propels my passion. So it's just an interesting thing to talk about, you know, where we, we have three day jobbers and when we talk to some staff people, it's just such a different conversation that I think is always going to be shifting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of that too, I mean, one of it is just we're millennials. So we inherited an insecure economy or an uncertain economy. And we've kind of made those decisions as we went along. Um, but what I pick up when I, when I talk to, to people that also have day job, I, the common factor for me is that, you know, we didn't grow up at a period where writing about film seemed like a viable career option in the way it might have 10 years before that or 20 years before that. So, you know, we never, I, none of the three of us, I think there was ever a point when we were little, we're like, we're going to do this. We're going to write about film. It's going to be our career. It was something we all came to later in life. We're like, oh, I can add this. I can take this thing and add it on top of the rest of my life. And that makes it more fun. And that to me is a bit of a different mindset. Like this never was at the core of my long-term goals. It was always something I was like, oh, this I'm going to plug this into the cracks and it's going to smooth everything over really nicely. Yeah, I mean, I stumbled into this. Like, I didn't. I did not plan to be a film critic who reviews 150 <laughs> horror movies a year. Like, this is something I kind of walked into. I totally agree. It's growing up. Like, I feel like if you had told the like tiny fangirl living in a hick town where like all the stuff that she liked was, you know, super lame and sort of contributed to being alone a lot. Like if you went back and told her like, hey, one day you're going to use this as a job and like people are going to pay you for your opinions Mm -hmm. on these things that you love so much, like that would have blown her mind. Like never in a million years did I think that this would be a job that I would have. Yeah. I mean, like if someone told that to me after my high school honors English teacher, who was also our film studies teacher, looked at me and said, you don't belong in this class, get out. I would have been like, wait, number one, why am I being paid to write about movies? Number two, how? Yeah. That's that New Jersey public school uh, education system for you there, Matt. He he knew exactly what he was talking about. Hmm. Uh, well, let me ask Amelia um, along those lines too. I mean, now that you are sort of plugged in, now that you, you know people that are um, in the industry on both sides, where do you find, we always ask about horror films specifically, but you can kind of open this up um, for some of the other stuff that you write about too. You know, where do you find yourself getting a lot of recommendations? Because you know, where are you going and where are you hearing about films that you need to see? Where are you discovering stuff on your on your own? Is it word of mouth? Is it you know just kind of trying to see what Twitter talks about and catch up with them later? Where's that discovery for you? I would say uh, it's a lot of Twitter and it's a lot of personal connections. Like uh, I remember a few years ago, like back when all the stuff really hit the fan in 2016, like somebody reached out and 
or somebody had tweeted something making the recommendation, like, look at who you're following. And if all of those people look exactly the same, reevaluate what you're doing. And I remember digging through my followers and thinking, holy shit, a lot of these people are like, are just white folks. Uh, And so I really made an effort to like diversify who I was following. And that has really helped me find new things that I wouldn't have looked at in the past. Like we, we talk about fast color and how, how that just sort of got dropped into a release situation. And I never would have heard of the movie if I hadn't started following different folks. Um, and I try to, I try to like reach out to people who, who like look at things a lot differently than I do, whether that be from like a world perspective or just from a taste perspective. Cause like, I'm, I'm pretty on brand. Like I want dinosaurs. I want kaiju. I want bloody things. Um, I want superheroes. But there are so many people who look at things so completely differently. And I, I, I like going to Twitter and I like going to like friends who I know feel differently, that kind of thing. Well, for you, for On Brand, um, since you brought it up, Donato and I have spent the weekend politely arguing about um, Gretel and Hansel, which we don't need to get into here. We don't have the week um, to decide. talk about that and argue yeah, about we don't. We don't have enough time. But what would you say if somebody is, you know, if somebody hears this podcast and wants to start following you on social media, like what are, what are those horror titles? Like what are the, what are the, you know, if you get why I love these, then you'll kind of understand everything else that comes with it. Like what are those Basically titles? Basically asking, what is your Black Coat's daughter to, to Matt Monagle's <laughs> Black Coat's daughter? That's, yes. I mean, no, nobody has a Black Coat's daughter. They, nobody obsesses the way that I do. I mean, I have demon film, wings. But... <laughs> like, what the hell are you talking about? No, I guess that's true. That's true. I'm sorry. I was rude of me. <laughs> we we need at least one demon wind mentioned per episode. You know this. I am so glad Joe Bob Briggs told me to watch that movie. That was. I will was fucking come to your house and murder you. <laughs> sorry, I asked a question. I don't even remember what it was anymore. Um, you were asking like, what was my one movie? Uh, and I. Or movies, yeah. more it can be more than one too. Yeah. What um, defines what defines this? I think if there were a singular one that like people wouldn't really expect, uh, I would go to Apostle of all films, and like I was like the Netflix Gareth yes, Evans. Okay. I was so loud about that movie um, because I loved it so much, and thankfully, like it debuted at Fantastic Fest, so I got to see it on a big screen. And I'm I'm not a snob about that kind of thing. I don't care if you're consuming movies on your phone. I don't care if you're consuming them on the largest screen possible. Like you watch movies however you want to watch movies. Um, I'm going to film critic jail. I'm sorry. Um, we'll be right there with you. Okay, great. I won't fuck phones. You don't watch on phones. Hey. You know what? If that's all you've got in your little itty bitty town, you watch however <laughs> you can watch. Okay. I am um, buying you a Quibi subscription so you can watch their like little ten, <laughs> ten minute. But. Uh, it was so gorgeous and it's so like the folk horror there. And I, I love anything that digs into theology or folklore or anything along those lines. And Apostle just goes so hard into that and it is so gnarly. Uh, so I stand that movie really, really hard. And there are a lot of people who are like, but why? Um, so I feel like that one, um, also it's not a movie, but uh, The Haunting of Hill House is mm. just deeply important to me in a different way because it's not really theological like it's not folk horror at all but just the how how detailed it is and how compassionate it is i like i started 2020 watching that series all over again that was my first day of this year and it, it like it felt like the right way to get going it was just Mike Flanagan is just so personal in it and just the cast is beautiful and really skilled and by giving you those emotional attachments to the characters like this the car scare that we all talk about uh like I screamed so loud and so long in that moment that I permanently traumatized my roommate's dog like scared the shit out of me and then I was immediately like I have to talk to everybody about what just happened like so anything that like digs in and like makes you feel this emotional connection through the terror. And I feel like a lot of folks don't necessarily get that. I was waiting for you to get Donato. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I would, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, the Hill House is, I keep saying Hill House is the first time I feel like Flanagan 
became the director that everyone else says he is. And I, I really don't mean that in a super snarky way. I just think he's just been a journeyman director who delivers exactly what you're expecting. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's still a lot better than a lot of directors out there and a lot of filmmakers out there. But Hale House and the emotional core that he hit, I finally saw what everyone else was seeing. And I, I, it is a special piece of, you know, it's not, it's not a film, mm -hmm. but it's still a piece, uh, to me, it's cinematic and it still is a special piece of cinema in that way. But um, I am actually, I'm curious to ask Matt now because I know The Black Host Daughter is one of them, but I think this is a fun question. Is you had three films that you had to describe yourself using. So I guess you have three films that make up your personality. What what do you think those three would be, Matt? Uh, that's a good question. I would say if I if I had to pick three, one of them would be Black Coat's Daughter. Uh, one of them would be Targets, the Bogdanovich joint, which I think is the maybe one of the most slept on films of all time. Um, and then uh, The Thing, Carpenter's The Thing, because how do you not do that? And I grew up in Alaska and it was shot in Alaska, at least for a little bit. So... I think those would be my three very similar, very thematically consistent, you know, films. So, um, yeah, those are mine. You can't list demon in three times. If I ask you what yours are, Donato. <laughs> no, I, I have very, Go, I'm fine with it. it. Um, off the top of my head going with like not more recent films, but at this point in time, I would say that I am most summed up by, uh, return of living dead, death chasm and, uh, the night comes for us. That is, that is just my energy and my, everything in a little trio of films and that is like the inherent tension of this podcast like in six movie titles is your three and my three right there that's everything you need to know that should be we should program like a back-to-back -back festival ourselves of just like movies that we select like i pick one you pick one i pick one you pick one just to throw everyone in the audience for the biggest loop possible whiplash man. yeah oh the whiplash would be frantic it would just be like Everyone is like bent over going like, how are we going from the black coat's daughter to random indie horror movie 17 that no one has heard of? I, every single post screening conversation would start with one of us going, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, it's not the title. Like the credits are still rolling and we just walk up going like, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Cut it off immediately. Well, I think uh, speaking of indie horror films that, nobody saw uh, that seems like a pretty good segue to talk about today's movie so when we come back uh, because we're going to leave for a second um, for thematic reasons and also because I left my notepad downstairs <laughs> when we come back we're going to talk about patchwork so stick with us it's nice to know she's on All right, so today we're going to be talking about the... When was it actually released? It says 2015. When did it come out on video? Uh, probably 2017, I think. I'm pretty sure it's a 2017 release. Okay, so the 2017 release Patchwork. It's a film by Tyler McIntyre, who you might know as the guy that wrote Tragedy Girls. And it is a film about three people sewn together, but not in like a you know gross human centipede sort of way, more in like a cool three souls, one body kind of thing. Um, the three main characters, Jennifer, Ellie, and Madeline, are each out on the town in an evening, and they each wake up and find themselves part of a collective whole. And the film sort of follows their Frankensteinian discovery process as they figure out who sewed them together, why they're sewed together, and how the three of them can use their newfound cooperative abilities to just kill the shit out of some frat boys and, and other folks. Um, that is, that's that's probably a pretty accurate summary of the film. I don't think I need to get in any more detail there. You really don't. So, no, that was actually bravo. That was spot on. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's, it, yes. Yeah, it's good. So let's start, um, as we always do. Amelia, you had a hand in picking this one, and, and I'd, I'd love to know what made this movie stand out to you. Uh, I, I keep describing it as like sort of low-key empowering, and I think... I think that's what like made it snag me. Like I originally watched it because Matt had been watching it and he texted me. It was like, you need to check this one out. Uh, and so I did that night cause I'd been looking for a movie and like two minutes in, I was like, yep. Okay. This is weird. I'm into it. Um, just the, the practical effects immediately like really snagged me, even though they're not always gorgeous. Like 
Owlcat is hilarious, but like he's not well done. But like looking Owlcat <laughs> Release the Owlcat. Archimedes. Um, we'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> um but like immediately like when they wake up on the table and you see their face just sort of stapled together and like the moment the finger moment where she flicks it <laughs> just like falls off. Like there was a lot of connection from the jump of just like this is weird. Uh I love the way it looks, even when it doesn't look gorgeous. Um so that kind of thing. And Donato says the first person that watched this will put this on your radar. So I knew about the film for a little while because it's directed by Tyler McIntyre or, or written and or is it written and directed? Written, and yeah, co- right co-written, now. co-written and directed. Co-written by. and directed by Tyler McIntyre, who is responsible for the fantastic social media slasher Tragedy Girls. And after I watched Tragedy Girls, I said, oh, what is he, what has he done? And immediately this film patchwork wasn't readily available though like i had to rent uh pay to rent it at that time so two years go by i still haven't seen it and i check my shutter monthly release schedule and lo and behold it's right there lazy saturday night or like lazy tuesday night whatever it was i put on patchwork and you know it hooks me because it has that reanimator vibe and it's definitely frankenstein it's definitely playing with all of that stuff corpses being mined for body parts but it is more reanimator to me in its sensibilities and tone, which is a huge horror comedy pull for me. So it, you get that factor of it. It's low budget. It doesn't do everything beautifully, as Amelia said. But the dedication of practical, practical effects and staying with that and knowing the film it wants to be, even if it doesn't look perfect, it still has the character of one of these like quirky horror comedies that... I think comes together, pulls itself together quite well when it comes down to the humorous aspects of it, but also telling a story of low-key empowerment, as Amelia said. And for a male director to tell the story, I think it has a unique viewpoint where you can obviously tell many times when a male is directing a film about females and you're just going like, okay, so this is your stereotypical viewpoint on the female perspective and we're not really getting anything that's super deep and i'm not saying that patchwork is super deep but i am saying that it does the girl gang stuff pretty well and i think there's a lot more here than in the general girl gang kind of road trip comedy well i want to back up um to this something you both mentioned because usually on the show we'll we'll start with saying like why is this film you know good or important or, or that conversation and we'll go okay and is it going to be entertaining for horror fans but you both mentioned kind of the the low budget aspect and i, I do want to say that like patchwork is a low budget but there in my experience there's two types of low budget right there's like low budget where they try for it and miss and then there's low budget where they they kind of bake their limitations into the production so this actually looks i thought patchwork actually looks really good obviously the costume, the makeup work is fantastic. It's just one of those films where the, the ceiling feels so the world that they've created seems really small because they were very careful not to, you know, put anything on the screen that they couldn't afford to put out there. So if you see this, it's not going to be one of those movies where you're like, oh, that looks like shit. It's going to be one of those films where you're like, okay, it's pretty like, it's a very LA type of horror film. It's telling a very small story or New York type of horror film. It's telling a very small story contained in a couple of different locations, but that gives it a bit of freedom to really ramp up what it's doing in those spaces. It's not trying to stretch too far. So it, it is a good looking low budget horror film. Yeah. And I mean, I think that plays to the film's benefit too, because as you said too before, when you were describing the film, this is about three girls who go out they're all in the same bar on a single night. And what we get is, is it seven acts, six acts? Eight? Seven. I think it's eight. eight. Oh, is it eight? Okay. Yeah. So we get the same night played a few different times from a few different perspectives through eight different acts. So the film is so smart in that way of we have an event. We're going to show the event first as it just unfolds from one certain perspective. And then as you learn more and more and you start seeing the world come together, it's still con- uh, contained. It's claustrophobic in a way because it's just the bar vix. It's just the frat house and then the surgical center. But... You keep going back to the same stuff and you keep picking up on new clues going like, oh, wait, that character's in the background of the first one, but now we get their perspective. And it's something that could have unwound very easily and it could have got tangled and messy. And I think that's one of the best things that McIntyre does here is keep the narrative going forward and he keeps it tight and he keeps it to the low budget constraints. And I I think that's one of the selling points of this film, Patchwork. Yeah. Um, So let's talk 
before anything else, let's talk about the the makeup. Um, yeah. Amelia, that was one of the first things you brought up. What is the? They don't ever actually name. Um, I think they call refer to her as Jennifer a lot because she's the the one of the three that they're interacting with. But the the trifecta person. I mean, do we just um, say what, the creature? <laughs> do, the creature. I guess we could say yeah. The let's just say the creature. Let's say the creature. Um, what what did you think of the the design? Not just the the makeup, but also the costuming, the the way that they the different looks they gave her throughout the film. What did you think of the the aesthetic they built up for the creature? So I was kind of lukewarm on it when she initially woke up. Like I I liked how weird it was. Like they intentionally go out of their way to have contrasts to show like these are three different people, and like we've discussed this a little bit where like you see the like facial makeup sort of shift throughout the film. Whereas in the beginning, it's very clearly three pieces of face. And then as things progress, like it just becomes Jennifer's face with a little bit of extra makeup on the eye. And I don't know if that was more to show, Hey, they're becoming one entity and knowing how to work together better now or if it was just we've run out of money and we don't want to keep doing these effects throughout the whole film i'm gonna choose to pick the first one because i like it a great deal um but the first one where like she's so angular and so different um i didn't love it i saw the purpose behind it but like as soon as they do their little makeover uh i was really into uh what they built there not just because it's it's aesthetically pleasing in a way that isn't necessarily the male version of like aesthetically pleasing. There's no male gaze there. Like she's got short hair. It's bubblegum pink, which you hear like so many right wing folks like go off about like, look at this girl's stupid hair. Um, so it's still, it's still beautiful, but like this pieced together monster in a way that like these women have envisioned as like something that they could never do, but they're doing now. Um, and from like the makeup perspective, just on the back of the wig, you constantly see the staple in the back of the pink hair. And I'm really into that. And I don't know why that detail grabbed me, but I love it. Yeah. And I, I think I go back to Larry Fessenden's Depraved, which recently came out, you know, not even a year ago. It's very good. Uh, yeah. No, it, again, a very good low budget Frankenstein film. And that was specifically Brooklyn centered. So you, you have these two, a West Coast and an East Coast Frankenstein reimagining. But both of them do the effects so well. And again, going to Fessenden's and the comparison point being like, you've created a creature and you go all into it. The creature wakes up and there's stitching everywhere and it looks like someone that's been pieced back together. So I wasn't expecting that kind of level of detail in Patchwork, to be honest with you, because I do think Fessenden had a little more money and a little more backing. But I compare Fessenden's creature to Tyler McIntyre's creature and I, I, there wasn't much difference. They, they looked pretty one, one to one. And the, number one, that would be a great double bill. I, I know Fessenden's a little more serious, but doing Depraved and Patchwork back to back would be a great little under the radar indie Frankenstein uh, double feature. But the practical effects that McIntyre does pull off, they are goofy in a way that still works. Bring up the owl cat again. One of the, I did not expect it to be a payoff at all. But you get, just to set the scene for everyone else, you know, this creature we're talking about is three women who have been knocked out, killed, and cut apart and stitched back together. And that is what the creature is. So Amelia talking about the face, you literally get, it's like a peace sign design where you get a line going down the middle and then two lines going left and right and three pieces. And the mouth is one head, one eye is one, one head, and the other eye is another head. The eye on the left is a blonde girl, so half of the hair is blonde. The eye on the right is a brunette or, you know, dark-haired girl. And so you have the hair completely split. And it looks ridiculous, but it also kind of looks funny and cheesy, and it builds right into the tone that they're going for. So I had it been a film that tried to play itself straight, had it been a film that let go of those jokey aspects, and when the creature is first stumbling around the surgical the, the uh, surgery room, and falls down and looks up at a cage. And <laughs> there is a hybrid owl cat that is clearly a puppet in the face of, of the creature. Mm -hmm. Should it work? I don't know. Does it work in the context of the film? Quite well. So I, the, the effects played to exactly what they had to be. And then you do get the gory bits of the creature killing people mercilessly. Maybe ripping someone's leg off and beating them with it. 
again, is this something that's completely on the spectrum of ridiculous horror content? Yes. Does it work in a film that has consistently beat for beat built up these kind of moments? That's where it wins me over. I agree. I was um I was really interested in the way that they kind of blended you know, when we see Jennifer, Ellie, and Madeline versus when we see the creature and how those two things are kind of kept separate. Because there's a lot of, there's a, I mean, there's tons of ghost stories. There's ghosts, there's always, there's hearts and souls. Like all of these films that sort of play with the idea of somebody that's watching over or, or trying to sort of take control of, of a human. And the idea, um, the idea that these three characters kind of have individual autonomy within this one collective thing that they're all, each one of them has a hand on the wheel. Um, I, I think that's that's a really interesting idea, and I liked the way that I, I thought that McIntyre actually did a really good job of not making that too comedic, uh, not making you know not having there be an overabundance of like scenes where they're falling down or like you know there were a few moments where it's clear that the three we see the three of them talking and then it snap cuts to just Madeline's creature standing there like talking to itself, um, but it, they kind of there was there was a sense I think of of understanding that. In order for the creature to work, we have to enjoy and appreciate these scenes where it's the three actresses playing off of each other. That balance was, was I was surprised at how much I liked that throughout. I thought that they did a good job with that. Because I think if you go the other way, like you said, if you go the way of just the creature the whole time and playing the gimmick of a fast talking creature who has three different girls saying different sentences and we do get a few of those moments where the creature's trying to keep pace uh, in dialogue and basically have a conversation with itself. If that was the whole movie, I think it'd be insufferable. It, it, number one, it would just get, that gimmick would run, run so dry and you have an actress just basically speed talking her way through scenes to pretend to be three different people. The three different people in the same room, just actresses playing with three different girls and we know that they're not really there. We know they're within the mind of the creature, but to show that they have their own personality and to show that they have their own decision-making skills and also do it in a way that, again, highlights the girl gang aspects of the film. Genius. I, like that is a way also around the budget too, yeah. because then you don't have to have the creature on screen the entire time. You can get away with just minimal effects work on the creature. This film was so thought out to what it was trying to make and Monogal to your testament before they knew how to work with the budget. They knew how to work with their constraints and turn them into strengths because that aspect of having three different girls on screen and, you know, they when they find out that their body, their vessel, this creature can't feel pain and you have that great cutback where they're in the creature form and they're looking at their finger, as Amelia said before, and they flick the finger off and they've stapled it back. It's a fun little thing in that moment, but then they realize they can't feel pain and they cut to two of the girls, like one is a hammer over the other's hand going like one, two. And it's just such a funny thing, like knowing like, yes, the creature itself standing in a kitchen holding a hammer over its own hand, tempting to hit itself is one thing. But to have the girls doing it in the group and have the girls doing it themselves is so much more fun. Yeah. And that kind of builds a bit to the the action stuff that we talked about. So Amelia, I, I want to ask you, because we were talking a bit about the pseudo empowering narrative that this offers, you know, the movie sort of jumps right into the killing um, the creature kills and then is like, Oh, that, that felt great. And then continues to kill and kills throughout pretty much the rest of the movie. So watching that, did you feel that, did you feel that that was, you know, kind of the question that we always have to ask ourselves that that was empowering? Do you feel like that was the, the, a male perspective on, or kind of like, you know, a, a slapdash look at what a woman's narrative revenge arc could be? Like, how did that all come together for you? I wouldn't call it slapdash. Um, I definitely feel like there are plenty of women who would love to go on a rampage like that. Um, rampage is definitely my favorite act in the whole in the whole movie um it's it's why matt texted me it was like you need to watch this movie. it was specifically for you know to actually contextualize this it was a moment where the creature gets to a frat house and the frat house has played a hand in one of the girl's deaths basically and that scene when the creature puts her uh, her headphones in and the music starts and the creature just busts in and starts kicking asses i, did, I immediately texted amelia and i was like hey this movie patchwork is on shutter and you should probably watch it <laughs> And like, it's, it's not even so much that the frat house had a part in Ellie's death. 
It is more the fact that there are these frat boy creeps who are trying to take drunk girls home and get them to have mm. sex with them on camera and like trying to like sweet talk them and be like, oh, it's fine, baby. Like, there are four of my friends in this room. <laughs> That's Dave. That's yeah. Doug. That's other Doug. <laughs> and we're going to gaslight you to make you feel like this is perfectly normal because you want acceptance and because you're shit canned. And so like that moment, there was no reason to necessarily kill them. And I don't care. It was amazing. <laughs> I, I do have to say that that to me, that whole sequence of the three individual stories, I think Ellie's is by far the best. And I think that's because that is that that character is the most interesting during her little arc too. like kind of the the way the the experiences that she goes through and the way that that plays into what goes on later. I think that of the three of them, Ellie, to me, was the most interesting of the three personalities. Yeah. And I, I think I was just going to ask that question, too. You know, who of the three we have Jennifer, Ellie and Madeline, do we walk away remembering the most? And Ellie was actually mine too. I, she starts as just the ditzy party girl who's out trying to, you know, find friends and go home with somebody. And, and she kind of ends there too a little bit, to be perfectly honest. Yes, a hundred percent. They, they but, kind of forget the work they did in the middle, but that's all right. Well, I, I think so. This is where you're going to have your problems with the film. I can already see that. But I think it's a more complete arc. I like the, the evolution that Ellie kind of goes on and she has her friends that, She's alone in the beginning and she's alone at the bar and she's alone for so much of it. And having Jennifer and Madeline, Madeline, I don't know why I said Madeline, then that's a weird pronunciation. Um, but having everyone together helps build her confidence. And the makeover scene too, when they're all telling each other things about themselves. And I don't know why I laugh so hard at it, but I think Amelia has the same line too. When Ellie just goes like, my favorite color is sparkly. And it's just like, that is exactly who this girl is, but it's such a telling moment of innocence and such a telling moment of of that char- like charismatic innocence. I like the character a lot. I agree, and I think like when when the film opens, uh, because Matt didn't initially tell me why he had recommended this film, and so it opens to like this very cold businesswoman, uh, Jennifer, sitting alone at a bar, like getting ready to talk about her promotion and her birthday. And I was like, did you recommend this to me because of this bitch sitting in this bar right now? Cause I'm going to fly out. And Just low key you. subtweeting you yeah. via movie. Like, yeah. What is that? Uh, and eventually like, as it played out, I was like, okay, we're not being called out here, but do I relate the most to Jennifer? Unfortunately? Yes. Uh, but Ellie's Ellie's journey, I think is the most important. And you, you kind of mentioned how like she basically still ends up like trying to like go home with somebody, which I don't necessarily disagree with, but I think she does it in a healthy way by the end because it's, it's not about Garrett. It's, it's about her little girl gang. Well, we can't yeah. say yeah. that like rest of that, but um, it's, it's, it's more about her and Jennifer and Madeline by the end than it is about going home with someone else. Yeah, I, I think the Garrett work, so we do have to mention that there is obviously a male put into the story who becomes a romantic arc for the creature. Garrett is a med student played by James Phelps. And w- which which uh, Weasley was he? He's Fred or George. I don't yeah, know. They're either, twins. <laughs> Fred or George Weasley. He's, he's one of the Weasley bros. And I was trying to place where the hell this guy was because he walks on screen and you immediately know you've seen him before. And for the life of me, I'm like, where and what? So I had to text Amelia and be like, why do I know James Phelps? She's like, Harry Potter. And I was like, oh, shit. (laughs) But his arc, I think there are some funny things with it because he becomes the kind of helper de facto uh, because the creature goes to James, uh, to Garrett, and asks for help. There might or might might not be some other romantic happenings that happen. And... I'm trying not to spoil, but yeah, okay. So the creature fucks Frank Garrett. and fucking. Yeah, there's there's Frank and fucking, which is a scene that I laughed so hard at. I don't. They play it so well, but by the end of it, I don't know if he had to be there. And I think that's one of the things I say about Patchwork. Um, if it just stayed the girl gang the whole time, and you just kind of like left Garrett more in the background, even I don't think we had to had have him coming in the finale. I don't think that had to be. 100% where the film went, but I, I I don't hate where it did go. So I actually disagree with you. God. Um, yeah. Solely because, like, going back to that sex scene, like, it's so criminally awkward. <laughs> it's the weirdest. There's 
a lot of drooling. It's fine. It's three girls trying to kiss one guy, it's, which is, and it's again, hilariously played by the creature. But so, so often in horror or, or really any genre, you watch these female characters be brought in solely to be murdered, solely to be a sex toy. Like their, their sole purpose is to be used. And I thought it was really interesting because Garrett plays that role. Like, no, he didn't have to be there narratively speaking, but it's interesting to see that flipped on its side where like the women are in charge here. Like he he's there to help. He is there to be banged and other things that I will not spoil. But I, I love that he's there. And I, I thought it was nice to see that flipped for once. Well, you changed my mind. Well, let me. That, let, is, that is fine. <laughs> well, let's jump into um, a bit of a spoiler section um, okay. for one of our last topics here, because I'm curious. You know, the last part of the movie really focuses on Madeline and the decision that she made, uh, which is spoiler alert, that she has picked her companions to be stuck in the creature's body. As someone who is dissatisfied with her own physical appearance, she has actually paid for the procedure, and this. Franken combining of the three women was entirely at her cost and her behest. So what do we think of that as um, sort of, I don't want to, it's not really a twist, but what do we think of that as, as a reveal? And how does that change the way that we think about the creature and the three women in her? I didn't necessarily, like, it didn't surprise me. It wasn't like a big twisty moment for me, but I still really enjoy it. And it mm -hmm. really drove home. Like, I keep calling it low-key empowering because it still has this girl gang situation. But going back to, like, stereotypes that are constantly played, like, women are either all petty bitches or women are like, we're all getting along, yay, rah, rah. And that's not women. That's not anybody. That's not how anything works. And so having this film that is, again, low-key empowering, focusing on three completely different girls, two of which do eventually like reach into, the, well, all three of them reach into this girl gang moment at one point, but you learn that Madeline is out for herself. And that's, that's a real thing. Like no gender works better together because of their gender. Like that's not, that's not how life works. Um, and so the fact that they drove that home and the fact that you're looking at a woman who is so focused on her own version of perfection that she will both murder and lie to these other two women to get it. Um, I think it's interesting having the, the female be the own villain in this situation. And I think it's great that we see Ellie who again is perceived as the weakest of the three throughout the entire film, be the one who delivers the line, we don't have to be perfect. Like I do a little dance at that line every single time I watch this movie, mm -hmm. Matt laughed at me. <laughs> like it's just, it's, it's a perfect line and I love it. And I love that it's Ellie that delivered it. And I like that they're showing these different perspectives of women all in one body essentially. Yeah, and then even for me on like the surface value, not even going that deep into it, which all that stuff is valid 100%. Like I'm not discrediting it, but if you even just look at it on the sense of you have now turned this creature feature, we'll say, it's pretty obviously a creature feature, into this weird kidnapping possession film that the women can't even escape. There's no escaping from it. Mm -hmm. The only way out is death. They're in the same body. There's no way to reverse the procedure. So they are now stuck together and they are now given this conflict of how do we even resolve the fact that three of us are in one brain and there's no out, like there's no escape from this. So I, I think just on these, I know that the film shows there is, but that itself is enough of a conundrum to happen at that point of the climax that I was 100% into it. It wasn't a twist. I, it wasn't something that hit me out of left field because you needed that that happening you needed that thing to come out of nowhere and go okay patchwork is now officially realized exactly what its uh, momentum is going towards but even though it is predictable it's still a really fun yeah. uh turn i would say not a twist it's more a turn yeah i, I mean I, I i think i'm with y'all um they do they they hint at it pretty early in the film that what one of these things is not like the other one of these things just doesn't belong uh but 
I, I think that the way that they set her character up and the way that they get to there with, with Madeline, her reasons for doing it are, I mean, I, I love someone who, I love monsters that, that turn into monsters through personal tragedy. And so I totally understand the arc that they're going for with Madeline. I understand why she feels that this is something that she needs to do. And I think it, it, from a narrative standpoint, um, Amelia, I think what you were talking about earlier with the, um, the frat brothers, I think it really actually locks that scene into place too. Like she's violent because one of them is violent. Right. And so some, one of them has this capacity in there. And so at any given point, you know, at that point, Madeline is the one that grabs the wheel and she's, you know, the other two are along for the ride. They're enjoying it as well, but it's why they, things can ramp up so quickly in the film is because they have this one person in there who is capable of these acts and gives the other ones the nudge that they need. So I, I think it, I think it does a good job of locking the three of them in. And I mean, the, the shot towards the end where it's Jennifer girl power, Ellie girl power and Madeline uh, with a giant drill hole right in the center of her forehead. That's, that's a pretty good shot. Yeah, the, the lobotomy aspect of it being the way out is very, that took me. I did not see that being the way that they were going to th- finish it off. So I was more uh, impressed by the way that they resolved the conflict of Madeline being crazy. And I also don't want to undersell the fact that I think the acting in this film is above where I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I, you know, yeah, I, I think the acting pretty much across the board, just looking at the three girls who haven't really done that much afterwards. You know, this is an indie film and they kind of have just gone the indie route and stuff like that. But I think Madeline is my favorite of the performances, just in the way that she's able to start bookish and able to play kind of the innocent little doe that you don't think, you know, air quotes I'm doing right here could ever turn into something else. But she does that reveal in a way that works for patchwork. And it's a fun performance for me. And even going further than that, though, I do want to call out the surgeon who is played by Corey Sorensen. And he is our Dr. Frankenstein. He is our madman, Herbert West, whatever you want to call him. It is so over the top. And the way that he delivers lines that he's not, he doesn't even hide the fact that he's doing something insane. He's a mad scientist through and through. He loves what he's doing. He takes so much pleasure in cutting people up and putting them back together. And when he finally confronts the creature for the last time. It's such a solid third act. And Corey is such a big part of that, especially when he releases the owl cat. <laughs> and the owl cat is such a dumb thing. You think it's a throwaway joke at the beginning. And he just screams, release the owl cat when he has no bullets left in his gun. And the owl cat comes out of the cage and immediately flies out a door. And after the owl cat flies out the door with this heroic music playing, you just get the surgeon who's kneeling down with his hands raised toward the sky, screaming Archimedes, the owl cat's name, just let out the most annoyed and frustrated, fuck! <laughs> it's per- a perfect line. It's a curse word. It's a throwaway word. But that in that moment really sold um, the surgeon on me. So I do want to give a lot of credit to the surgeon. But then one more question on the acting now for both of you. How do you think the males in this film were portrayed because obviously the males in this film were all meant to be both, you know, like predators and victims. So, you know, victims in the way that they were the creature's victim and predators in the way that they deserved it. So I'm just wondering if that worked in the way that it should have worked for both of you. Uh, Kind of playing off of what you said about uh, the surgeon being so exceptional. uh, I, I like that both Garrett and the surgeon are, acted so well in their respective roles because going going back to Garrett and how Garrett is solely like a tool in in this film the surgeon is as well like he's not the main antagonist he's just there doing what this other character is asked to do like Madeline is the main antagonist here we don't find it out until later but both both of them are are solely tools and the fact that they are acted so well makes that both more palatable and more fun. Um, And then so far as all of the other male stereotypes, (laughs) like when we were rewatching it, you had asked me like, is this a real thing? And just for every single one, as we're going through like these awful people, like the artist, the frat boy, like all of these terrible stereotypes, like I guarantee you any woman, you know, has dealt with multiple of them 
all of the time. And whichever one of them she's dealt with the most is going to be the most annoying. Like the artist made me want to throw myself out of a window because yeah, we've dealt with that guy. So like, I think that's, that's a fun conversation for dudes who are watching the film being like, this isn't real. It's super real. We deal with it constantly. The one that I turned, it was just like, oh, I know that guy was the uh, TV show host who introduced himself to Madeline at the bar. And he or he the first thing he does is order a cocktail named after him. Oh, yeah, that's a Tom Blake. I'm Tom Blake. It's named after me. Like we we've all been to a festival and know that guy. Like, but I I do ask that question because that it is a thing where, you know, some people may look at this and say, oh, all these male stereotypes are over exaggerated. The artist, just that pr- extreme pretension, you know, that's not a real thing or the nice guy, like, of course, he's just the nice guy, blah, blah, blah. It, it, so, I mean, like, yeah, that that is why I asked that. Yeah, it's it's super real. Uh, oh, there was something else that you said that I wanted to touch on. Is it about Tom Blake? Can we talk more about Tom Blake? It was about Tom Blake. Yeah, yeah, Tom Blake. <laughs> it's like every single festival. Like, there's, like, he, he has a line where he's talking about an industry contact, and I was just like, nope. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I don't have to deal with you until next festival. Please leave. Yeah, I think for for me, the important thing with horror, I think, is to be aware that a lot of the a lot of horror films are operating within tropes uh, that are operate at the film level or the character level. Like there are stock characters that are supposed to exist. And, you know, the thing about like the woke period of horror where people push back on that, like the Black Christmas, Black Christmas, fucking great, Black Christmas backlash that people gave. I think the the important thing is if you watch something like this, and there were times in this film where I felt it, you can do two things. You can say, oh, this character doesn't feel right to me. And if you gender swap this character, if you put them in the other shoes, I probably wouldn't bat an eye at the hundreds of times I've seen this character, you know, as another gender in previous films. So I need to keep that in mind and recognize like, oh, well, you know, this guy character, I don't relate to that character, but I've seen that version, that character as a female character a hundred times in horror films before. So that's usually when I'm like, oh, okay, that's probably more me than the movie then. Because if I don't think about it um, when it's a female character, but I do think about it when it's a male character, then that's on me. That's not on the movie. The movie's doing what it what it needs to be doing. And that's something I think that, that I, you know, I sometimes feel when I'm reading criticisms of, of different horror, usually not by people that I know, obviously, but it's just the idea that like you got to be able to step out your side of yourself for a second and think about like why, what context wouldn't this have stood out to me? And what does that say about the types of movies that I consume and what I'm noticing? Yeah. And I think the one last thing I do want to ask Amelia specifically, because this is going to lead into a tidbit I have actually, it's some information that I found out after watching Patchwork about another movie that me and Amelia have watched recently at Fantastic Fest, actually. And I I don't know if you've seen this either, but getting to my first question, the way that I have said before that Tyler McIntyre, a male director, directs a female-centric film is above the grade of other male directors that have tried the same exact kind of tropes and the same exact kind of narrative. Do you agree? Do you think that, you know, McIntyre's view in both this and Tragedy Girls is fairly respectful and honors the female perspective in a way that should be done. Oh, I agree. Full stop. Like when, when you recommended this to me and like, I saw that it was, you know, three women um, and that it was focusing on their story. Like it was kind of like, okay, well I'm sure this was directed by a dude. Uh, And then I saw that it was Tyler and like knowing tragedy girls was like, okay, all right, I will give you the shot. I will see, I will see what you have to say. Uh, yeah, I think that influenced a great deal about me wanting to check this out further because Tragedy Girls, like we've we've talked a little bit about, you know, struggles I may have had with some middle arcs, but uh, like outside of that is is really solid work that you wouldn't expect from a male director. But the thing is, is like it's it's not only male directors or it's not only female directors who can tell female stories. Like I'm, I'm not here to say that men can't do that, but the problem is, is that so many men don't have those conversations with the women in their life. And like, not only not have the conversations with the women in their life, but like, listen to those conversations. Cause like, I'm sure all of these directors have girls around them at one point or another, but just, you can tell that Tyler keeps himself surrounded by women who he hears their honest opinion about and kind of puts that perspective in his films. So it, that was a big driving influence 
So uh, that leads into a little fun fact that I found out about Matt. Did you see We Summon the Darkness at Fantastic Fest last year? Uh, was that the witchy culty one? Uh, not witchy, no. but yes, it was the culty Alexandra Daddario uh, Satanic Panic film. No, uh, you talked about it a lot, but I did not see it. I did, yeah. So I liked it. I thought it was fine. Amelia, I liked it too. A little less so, but I, I like, I liked it. But there were a lot of frustrations, which we're about right. to get and into. Right, and so <laughs> after I watched Patchwork, I tweeted about it, and um, I'm followed by Common Enemy, who is a producer on We Summon the Darkness, and he tweeted at me and said, "Oh yeah, like Tyler's so talented. I really like Patchwork a lot." And then he said. Fun trivia, Tyler was the original director of We Summon the Darkness, but there were scheduling issues. And that forced me to think about We Summon the Darkness in a way that kind of brought back... I liked We Summon the Darkness, but the way it handled the girl gang aspects of it, um, very leery. Like, why are we having multiple shots of the camera between the girl's legs in leather? And like, why are we seeing multiple shots of very it's very sexualizing in a way that that's not the whole girl gang trope. Like there are other things to do with the girl gang than putting them in hot clothes and putting them in suggestive poses over and over again, which I'm not saying it wasn't, I'm not saying it was done in a way that was offensive or a way that like kind of was I'm, Amelia, just go, <laughs> just, just go. <laughs> no, nope. no, Donato, nope. take your way out. Keep I'm going. Just Amelia take over. He can see my face. <laughs> So. I was just gonna. I was like, I knew, I, I knew what I wanted to say, but I knew she was gonna say it a lot better. So that is why we bring people with different perspectives on this podcast. We should, we should have no. We should definitely have more episodes where we talk about the portrayal of women in horror films and just have you stare, have someone <laughs> stare at you. All of our guests are gonna be at, in your apartment. You can just FaceTime me, and I will make faces at you when you're saying something that maybe you shouldn't say. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, you're right. It's very male gazy, um, and it's. I feel like we. Both of us walked out of it positive. Yeah, like yep. both of it were like both of us were like solid three stars. Like okay, I didn't, I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. But looking at the description of that film, I should have loved that movie. And the male gaze aspect of it really took me out of that. And like I say that as a bisexual woman, I really like looking at girls. What I don't like is when your sole purpose with your camera work is objectifying them um and as for the girl gang aspect in we summon the darkness there isn't one there's and i talked about this with patchwork a little bit like there are different kinds of women like i'm not saying that like they need to be buddy buddy or they have to form this girl gang but they're each one of them is solely a trope like that's it that's their only purpose However, on the flip side of that, you have these boys that they've like captured and they're these metal dudes, but like they're also really sympathetic. They're also really sweet. So like somehow these tertiary characters are given more autonomy than the main arc. And I think that's their way of trying to address the fact that like women can be evil too. They can be the bad girls too, but the way they do it. And that's the beauty of tragedy girls. They are the bad guys. Like yep. they're the protagonists in the film, but these these kids are straight up slaughtering a lot of folks. And I'm on board with that. Like I loved that. Like there was there was no comeuppance. There was no anything. It was just girls being evil as hell while also being buddies. Uh, like there's there's no question that that women can be evil, but you've got tragedy girls that does it real real well and then you've got we summon the darkness that puts alexandria daddario in some caricature in leather and like when you when you sent me that tweet i remember being so angry because i should have loved we summon the darkness and i just thought it was fine yeah and now we're forced to think about what if tyler mcintyre got to make his version of we summon the darkness i'm i'm a little i i myself like it it almost makes me want to readdress my review and knock down like half a star just to be like knowing what this could have been and knowing the places it could have gone. I shouldn't have been so one note on it. I should have loved this film too. It's metal horror. That's my thing. I said Deathgasm before because that is my jam. And I mean, if you can't win me over with metal horror because it's boring in a way. And I say there's someone who liked the film, 
again, we saw the darkness. I think it's still watchable and it's something that should be discovered. But God, I should have loved it. I should have loved it. Yeah, it should have been way better than it was. And like, and I had that feeling coming out of it. Like, I the male gaze thing was acknowledged. Like. Totally we talked about it immediately point. after the film. I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. But the fact that it didn't have to be that way makes me so angry. Just like, I, I feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over again. Like, should have loved it, did not love it. I'm very angry that I did not love it because it should have been extremely my shit. Release the McIntyre cut. Yes. <laughs> that is my new project. Even though it doesn't exist anywhere and we know that he didn't make the film. Well, still release it. Cut. All I have to add to this conversation is if Certified Forgotten never needs a tagline, I think I would like it to be evil as hell, also buddies. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good one. I'm stealing your line, Amelia. Okay, that's fine. Two white dudes stealing a girl's line. That tracks. (laughs) Boom. I'm no longer the worst Matt on this episode. Just waiting for Um, that. Well, I would have given her attribution. Uh, Damn it. So to wrap wrap the podcast then... um, the last thing we like to do, this movie has been certified forgotten. We have certified that it has been forgotten with three reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. So should this, did this deserve its fate? Does it deserve rediscovery? Um, or does it deserve to say sort of in the, the, the bargain bin of Rotten Tomatoes horror films? I mean, I'll... S- Amelia, go no, first. I'm, I'm no, I'm starting. Amelia, go Fine. first. Fine. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start first really quickly just because, yes, it is three reviews or three total reviews on Rotten Tomatoes, two positive, one negative. Shout out to our girl, D- uh, Dee Dee Crimmins, who is one of them. But the thing I noticed is this is a 2015 festival film and all the reviews here are from 20, one from 2018, two from 2018, and then one from 2019, which means either A, it was reviewed by publications that were never on Rotten Tomatoes or still are not on Rotten Tomatoes when it did the festival run. But then it came out in 2017 and it still didn't get watched by anyone. And I know IMDb says it was released on the internet. So 2017, it was still VOD pretty heavy. I'm curious why it didn't go IFC Midnight or something of that nature. I don't know why this got buried so hard considering the multiple films that I watch per week that have much worse budgets and much worse visual appeal and all these things. So I don't know why it was actually this forgotten. I don't know why it didn't get any festival bumps on Rotten Tomatoes, why it didn't get anything on release. So yeah, I'm going to say rediscover this one a hundred percent. I agree. Definitely. Um, I, I, I think it's a lot of fun. I, I think that it acknowledges its restrictions and it laughs at itself when it should laugh at itself. It's got really solid practical effects, which I will scream about the rooftops forever. Um, I think it's fun and I think it's funny and I think it definitely shouldn't have gotten slept on. I'm okay not canonizing this one. Uh, I think that that if you've listened to the show by now, you could hopefully people know when I don't talk about a movie in a certain way, that means that I'm not trying to you know, derail the conversation and letting people enjoy it. The only thing I'll say at the end is I'm, I'm I, increasingly, I'm just aware that I'm not a horror comedy guy, that that's not that, that I, I find that I approach those kind of in, a, in, a, in the wrong mindset and I, I get cranky about them and I start getting frustrated when jokes don't land, which is more on me. But the one thing I'm always aware of my one criteria when it comes to horror comedies are I'm conscious of the mindset that sometimes filmmakers have, which is that if it's good, we meant it to be good. And if it's bad, it's because we didn't have a budget and how that kind of bleeds into a lot of the jokes that people try and tell. And in that grand spectrum of, you know, movies that could fall under those, I do. There are a lot of times where I felt that patchwork joked and was like, eh, you know, whatever, we're cheap. Like if the joke landed, whatever it, it didn't, it, it was more interested in turning and kind of shrugging to the audience and being like, eh, than it was, um, on some of the, the narrative world building elements. Now, part of that is just horror comedy, right? Like oh, there, there's a lot of fourth wall breaking in horror comedy. Most of them are going to, like this one starts with a, an overt homage to Reanimator. So it's not like it's going to spend the whole movie with this kind of narrow world building and character development. But for me, I just, I, I'm low budget horror comedy. It has a really high barrier of, for entrance for me. Like you got to be really, really good for me to not immediately be kind of put off by the premise. And I agree with a lot of what you guys had to say about why this movie is good and the audience it'll have. I'm just saying that this is not a movie that I will probably ever seek out or watch again. Cause, cause I'm, I'm, I'm an asshole. I don't like horror comedy. <laughs> I can't, I, I'm, I did not realize that that was a thing probably until I watched this. And I was like, I don't think I've liked what, like, I didn't like Anna and the Apocalypse. I didn't, I'm like, I don't, maybe horror comedies just aren't for me. Well, you just don't have a soul is the 
bigger part that of could it. be true i think that i mean amelia amelia has been saying for quite a while that i have no soul amelia has just recoiled butter at, sandwiches and other stuff when you said you didn't like anime apocalypse she just recoiled in her chair and shot straight up going like what i'm really upset right now I'm- monogal first of all second of all yes you are a sociopath because of your peanut butter tendencies like it's true that's who. you need you need that some is help, very true friend. Yeah, and look, I, I'll be honest about it. It's a it's a preference thing. I think that this movie has, a, if, if you are the type of person that likes this movie, you're really going to like this movie. And I think for horror fans, that's more of them than not. I just happen to be part of the smaller crowd. So in this case, I would say if you are trying to decide if you want to see it, it is on Shudder right now. So most of you who have access to Shudder can watch it as soon as you want. Probably listen to Amelia and Donato. Don't listen to me. I think you'll like it more than I did. I mean, I know you'll like it more than Monogle did because he just watches Sauna and the Black Hood's Daughter every day, all day, and nothing else, apparently. They're allegories for grief, Donato. How don't you love Stop that? being a sad little Alaskan man. I cold and dark. That's where I live. I but cold, like, I dark. <laughs> I agree with you on those things. Like, I like those allegories, but like, not liking it in the apocalypse. Like, I got a side with Donato. I don't think you really have a soul. I'm sorry about Boom. that. Boom. That's okay. I know I know the monster that I am. Um, there's three of me sewn together, but they're all just me and they're bitchy about horror comedies. <laughs> so um, that is it for our patchwork episode. Uh, Amelia, if people want to see the writing that you do, hear your thoughts on um, popular criticism and horror films and everything like that, what are what are your forward facing social media platforms? What do you, what do you engage on and what do you invite people to follow you on? Uh, I'm on all of the major so- major social media platforms. Words are hard. Um, I'm on Twitter the most. It's Brown Coats Or. Uh, I'm not going to spell that. Like I'm sure it'll be tagged somewhere. Um, but Twitter's Twitter's the best spot. Where do you go if you want to see pictures of your dog? Um, definitely post those on Twitter. Those are on my Instagram okay. too. Okay. Yeah. She's the best dog. Just FYI. He's real fluffy. But like story's also real good. Yeah, yeah. That's actually, I think that there are a couple of film critics and I would include you as one of them where I started following them or started really engaging with you because you have an awesome dog. And then I was like, oh, all this other stuff is really great too. But it was the dog that really like, you're not the only one. Like I just started following the person you were hanging out with last night because she has the golden retriever puppy. Brittany Stanler is a saint and you should have been following her already, but that's fine. Also, you probably that is with her multiple yeah, times. Yeah, she's a PR rep. Oh, that could be true too. I don't know. Uh, Donato, where do people follow you? What, what do they want to see what you have to say? I mean, I don't know why you'd want to follow me, but if you do want to follow me at Donato bomb on Twitter, letterboxd and Instagram, my writing, you can find on slash film and other websites at this point. And, uh, yeah, I'm in the new Fangoria. I'm kind of on video <laughs> things sometimes. I don't know. Just follow my social media and I'll hold myself out as usual. Good way to put it. As for myself, you can follow me, just Twitter, just do Twitter, Lab Splice, L-A-B-S-P-L-I-C-E. Um, you know, if you follow any of us, we'll talk about what we're writing and we'll share those articles. So you'll be in good shape there. I want to say thank you to our special guest, Amelia, who flew all the way out to Los Angeles to record this episode. Probably not true, but that's the way that I'm going to think about it going forward. <laughs> It was great to have you on the show, and um, yeah, we hope to have you you back the next time we have like a good Frankenstein-y three in one kind of movie. We'll be sure to we'll be sure to come to, to you with that first. Oh, great! Thanks for having me. I had a fun. Did you, I, had do you a want fun. to? Take- I had a, a fun. fun. One fun. One you want single to, uh, fun, and it was Monogle, not you. You're awful. Oh, see, the fun thing about Amelia is she switches who she hates constantly throughout the show. So yeah, some of, one of us is always up, and one of us is always down. I contain the um, dudes. Do you want to, uh, since we are back now at the new year and we are promising to our listeners that we're going to be producing episodes semi-regularly, do you want to seal that promise with a demon wind kiss? Do, do you want me to? Do, do, we, do we want to jump back into this? This is a new start. We can, we can leave. We can walk away from the demon no. wind or we can stay with it. You got closer to the microphone, which tells me you're ready. Demon wind.